Okay, I expect there'll be a few more, more join us as we go, but um, uh, respecting everybody's time and uh, uh, possibly joining in your lunch break, we will kick off uh, now. Um, thank you for joining us today for the next in the WOBC uh, Big Issues, in, Big Ideas in Biodiversity Science. Uh, webinar series and today we're looking at measuring nature and biodiversity supporting nature positive outcomes uh, and um, a, a really timely topic uh, for discussion today in opening the meeting i would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are meeting on today i'm joining you from wajuk Noongar land in the in the city of perth here in western australia uh, and it's a great privilege for those of us who work in uh, biodiversity and conservation and environmental management to be working in a landscape that has had continuous management by traditional owners over many uh, millennia um, and, and something that we are privileged to join uh, for this period of time uh, in, in doing that uh, work uh, alongside traditional owners. Uh, and in addressing this topic of uh, valuing nature, um, very much a topic that uh, crosses those boundaries of uh, Western finance, uh, Western understanding uh, and traditional understanding and value uh, to nature as well, uh, something that's deeply held uh, in our communities. Uh, for those that have been to our webinars before, you uh, know who the Western Australian Biodiversity Science Institute are, but uh, uh, for those who haven't, a brief introduction. Uh, WOBC is a joint venture uh, that works between uh, research, government, com community, funders, regulators, industry. We work in facilitating collaboration. Uh, we're trying to address those big strategic biodiversity knowledge priorities for our state uh, and hopefully uh, of relevance uh, well beyond the state of Western Australia. Our joint venture members include the four research universities in Western Australia, four government departments, who have uh, management or regulatory responsibility for uh, the environment in the state, along with CSIRO, the Commonwealth Science Organization, uh, and the West Australian Museum. We take a, an end user led uh, approach to our work. So our, our end users of knowledge uh, tell us what their challenges are and, and where the, the knowledge gaps uh, exist. Uh, and we work through from that end of uh, the spectrum through to understanding where those knowledge gaps can be addressed by research and then prioritizing research with our research stakeholders uh, in an iterative process back and forth, uh, reconfirming along the way with the end users of the knowledge. Uh, in our last um, overarching review of knowledge gaps uh, that our uh, end users and stakeholders were facing, uh, Understanding biodiversity finance, economics, and the emerging issues through TNFD, uh, nature positive, and all, all of these sort of buzzwords that are current uh, stood out as an area of, of need, uh, and it's an area that we have sought to address. Um, all of our, our programs of work lead to uh, prioritized research uh, programs uh, that address uh, the topics at hand and uh, provide guidance as to the research priorities that will address the end user or the stakeholder uh, needs to in uh, delivering their work going forwards. So as I mentioned, uh, we uh, identified that um, biodiversity finance and economics or, or uh, natural va nature values uh, was an area where people were asking a lot of questions and seeking seeking information uh, so we were really fortunate to be able to have uh, associate professor ram pandit join us uh, on a secondment from one of our member organizations at uh, the university of western australia uh, where he's uh, an associate uh, associate professor uh, he's come and joined wobsy for two years to lead our biodiversity finance and economics uh, program uh, Ram is a, a globally respected academic working in uh, environmental economics, uh, and uh, so it's a great privilege to have him join us and bring insights from global groups like uh, the International Panel on uh, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, IPBES. Uh, and he comes to this not 
uh, not just as an e economist, but uh, with a background in, in forestry and forest management. So having that breadth of environmental understanding. Uh, Saram is uh, going to be our speaker today. Nor uh, it's been uh, the norm in our last few webinars to bring international uh, experts to speak to our WA audience uh, and today having our internal expert, also an international expert, uh, speaking to our WA uh, audience uh, and addressing this really timely issue uh, in the week before the world uh, gathers, uh, or world leaders gather in Sydney uh, for the Global Nature Positive Summit uh, next week where both uh, Ram and I will be participating in that event. Um, so uh, without too much further introduction, I will um, stop sharing my screen to allow Ram to uh, bring his screen up and hand the floor uh, to, to Ram to lead us through the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Before I do that though, uh, if you have questions uh, as we go, please put them in the chat uh, and I will um, be uh, curating some questions out of uh, the feedback we receive along the way um, to ask in a sort of discussion with Ram in the last 30 minutes of the session. Thank you. Over to you, Ram. Uh, you're on mute, Ram. Okay. Um, thank you, On. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar uh, entitled Assessing Challenges in Measuring and Valuing Biodiversity for Decision Making. Before I begin, I would like to pay my respect to the elders past and present, their belief, traditions, and the customs which they uh, continue to practice, um, and also uh, to their values of nature and how do they care nature. So my deep respect to them. Uh, secondly, I would also like to thank um, Dinesh Thapamagar, who worked with us uh, in this particular task for the last four months as a postdoc uh, helping us to develop some of the content uh, that I'm going to present. So uh, a warm thanks to Dennis uh, for his contribution to this. Uh, as I frame this talk uh, a bit, um, focusing more on not only measuring but valuing. So I will be highlighting a couple of things in both aspects, what we found um, during our uh, um, research in order to prepare a work program for biodiversity, finance, and economics for OAPC for WA uh, stakeholders primarily. So the way I would like to navigate um, the next uh, 50 minutes or so is to introduce for all of us, the understanding that we need to have about biodiversity, primarily the impact that we create on biodiversity through economic activities and so on, as well as the dependency that we have on nature or biodiversity for our operations, ranging from a paddock level work to all the way to a big corporations and their uh, investments and work uh, related to uh, nature related activities and also the government's work and activities that relates to nature. So understanding this Im impact and dependencies is fundamental and what drives uh, nature is partly related to how we interact with it. So I'll highlight a bit of a conceptual way of thinking about this understanding nature, human relationship, nature economy relationship in some sense. Then I'd like to flag very briefly uh, the research approach that we adopted um, up until now in this process, which is assessing knowledge gaps or challenges to mainstream biodiversity in both private and public decisions. Uh, we took a phase way approach on it, uh, initially looking at what we learned from the literature, 
global literature, Australian literature, and based on some key consultation with his stakeholders. And then we'll move on to the next phase. So this is the outcome of the first phase. So then quickly, I'll move on to what did we find in this initial exploration, which is reviewing the literature and the consultation with the key stakeholders. I'll briefly touch on the journey that, the, that we have taken globally, moving towards um, bringing nature or mainstreaming nature or biodiversity into our um, decisions, both in public and private space and community space as well. Then what we find about measuring biodiversity. This is a topic that is highly technical, but um, based on the literature, based on our exploration, how we measure nature or biodiversity. Uh, I'll highlight some of those findings. And then I will spend very, uh, at least just two or three slides talking about valuing biodiversity. This is a topic um, perhaps I can talk a bit in length, um, but contextualizing it to what we learn from literature, I'll focus on what are the ways we value biodiversity, what's our current practice to some degree, both at corporate and at the uh, government level. And when you think about va values, as on indicated earlier, uh, there are many different ways we can value biodiversity or nature. The traditional and indigenous knowledge system has one way of looking at it. The Western science has a somewhat different way of looking at it. So th there is uh, some level of uh, one can argue about debate on valuing it, uh, which is right or wrong. But I think what is important is considering a holistic way to think about biodiversity and valuing it from that. So I'll briefly touch on that. Uh, what do we mean by pluralistic way of valuing biodiversity? Then the important point about uh, the emerging space is financing biodiversity. Uh, what are the current trends? or mechanisms or reactors in this space. Uh, I'll briefly highlight that. Then another aspect in relation to mainstreaming biodiversity or nature is sustainability reporting. What are the current uh, practices or evolving space in mainstreaming biodiversity through sustainability reporting. So I'll touch on that very briefly. Then I'll spend some time to document or highlight challenges and knowledge gaps that we observed from the literature. Then focusing on Australia and Western Australia, um, what are some of those challenges and knowledge gaps? What we have been doing both in the policy space and in practice, I'll shed some light on that. So to start with, mainstream biodiversity into private and public decisions requires understanding biodiversity, the role biodiversity plays or nature plays in our economic activities or in our life. We need to understand that first. Once we understand it, then alongside our understanding, developing that understanding, or once we understand it, we need to measure biodiversity. What is out there? How much is out there? How can we measure it? Once we measure it, then we need to somehow rather put importance on that, the value that biodiversity or nature has. Valuing biodiversity comes in sequence. Then once we value it, it, it is not the end of the story. We need to integrate those values, multiple, the Western science perspective or indigenous and local knowledge-based perspective or however the way we valued it, then we need to integrate that value into our decisions. Decisions taken needs to be followed through monitoring, reporting, and reviewing our actions and the impact. So this is a, in a way, this is a line of thinking we have to have to mainstream biodiversity into our um, private public decision making. So I'll touch on understanding a bit just to highlight how important the biodiversity or nature is for our life. And I'll take some um, numbers published in the literature and touch on the measuring aspect as I alluded earlier 
um, very briefly on valuing and spend most of the time talking about the knowledge gaps on the other space. Not necessarily talking about the monitoring reporting other than mentioning reporting, um, disclosure uh, reporting or sustainability reporting initiatives that are emerging, I will highlight them. So if we think about in a very plain language, biodiversity is an integral component of natural capital. Natural capital consists of both living and non-living environment around us, upon which we rely on in many ways. Biodiversity, both plants, animals, and the interactions that happen between living and non-living environment in which we live in, generates what we call ecosystem assets. So ecosystem assets consist of the interactions of living, non-living component in the nature, and non-living aspect of the natural capital could be air, uh, solar, and those sort of other aspects of the environment. And ecosystem asset is a principle or the stock that we have as ecosystem functions itself, the interaction between living and non-living component in the ecosystem takes place. Those functions and processes generate a range of ecosystem services, as we all know all the way from provisioning services to cultural services, maintenance or regulating services and so forth. All of they are a flow or the interest payment of the cap principle we have in the bank. So those flows are perceived by people and used by people for their economic activity and living and other things. And they are the benefits for people. Those benefits contribute to human well-being. So we, our well-being depends on the benefit derived from the ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are the product of the ecosystem processes and functions. Biodiversity is the building block of that process. It directly provides that benefits and contributes to our well-being through cultural values, through our observation of nature, through our the amenity services that we directly consume, or through the processes by which regulating or provisioning services are generated. So this is how biodiversity, in a sense, acts as a building block and contributes to human well-being. If we look at this a bit more closely, what's happening on this? Um, this middle portion here is the natural capital, all different types of services that I alluded. Um, our economy and as a society, we depend on them for different types of provisioning, regulating, and cultural services. Through those drawing of those services, we impact nature. Our impact on nature primarily originates from two sources. One is our demand of nature service to us is greater than the nature's ability to supply that services, which is this our supply. Our demand is greater than the service supply. Um, particularly, nature's ability to provide provisioning services um, is compromised if nature's uh, is if our demand of provisioning services is greater, it will compromise nature's ability to regulate itself. So its ability to produce regulating services like different type of ecosystem service, so water filtration, other kind of geochemical processes that happens, that will also be compromised. So at the current state, picking from uh, Dasgupta review, the, our demand exceeds the sub nature's ability or of supplying the services at the order of 1.7 to 1. And associated with that is a lot of our operations, businesses, and economic activities depends on nature. When that balance is disturbed, they will generate different type of biodiversity risk to uh, economic agent. Biodiversity also has a little bit of economic tone here. Uh, it has a, what we call public good nature, which basically means the governments, uh, the under provision of the resources to conserve or manage biodiversity from public agency and under investment from private agencies because the benefits of conservation 
is not squarely captured by the private entity. It has a beneficial spillover effect to the society. So that sort of dilemma we face in. All of these creates a gap in financing or financing biodiversity. If we can generate financing for biodiversity somehow rather by aligning this sort of situation that we observe in dealing with biodiversity, managing our biodiversity risks, risks somehow, and through reporting of environmental social governance type of uh, requirements from private sector and alike. If different form of finances are generated, then we can use that in order to build the capital, in order to enhance the biodiversity and then maintain that balance. So the economic side of the story is much about this part, the link between natural capital and economy and society, demand, supply. The financing side of the story is how do we, how do we go back and provide uh, some of these uh, essential things that needs to be done in nature in order to rebuild it. So thinking from that, if we simply look at our dependency, we know uh, the published report suggests that 55% of global GDP is dependent on nature, uh, moderately or heavily. Uh, the number could be somewhat up and down, but the essence is that we heavily depend on nature. We impact nature. And the balance between human activity or economic activity and nature needs to be maintained. Nature, economic economy is part of the broader environment. It's not outside the broader environment. So we need to maintain this balance. So we need to understand our dependency. We need to understand our impacts. We need to understand the risk originating from that imbalance. What uh, are the factors behind it? Uh, well, uh, those factors are well documented. Um, the IPC, sorry, IPBES in 2019 produced its global assessment of biodiversity and ecosystem services and highlight a lot of indirect drivers. Our belief and value systems are part of the indirect driver. And five dominant direct drivers, including our land use um, and ocean use, over exploitation of the resource, the climate change. Uh, pollution, invasive species, and so forth, affecting all type of ecosystem, terrestrial, freshwater, and marine. These are just some numbers to highlight that fact. If we simply look at the species, we know that 60% 60 60 of the population of the species decline across the vertebrate species since 1970. So we see this sort of impact, negative impact on the environment uh, because of this impact drive over time. We see a similar situation if we look at the oceanic ecosystem, for example, 33% of fish stocks are overfished. In the terrestrial ecosystem, more than 85% of wetlands have been lost. And there are other impact of impact on nature because of these direct drivers. If we think broadly about the planetary boundaries and in both on the physical sense, uh, we have exceeded out of the nine um, planetary boundaries looked at, uh, six of them have exceeded the pl safe planetary boundary, and one of them is the biological integrity, both at the gene level and um, bi gene level as well as at the functional level. If we think about the safe and just environment, uh, just Earth system boundary, which combines both the stability and resiliency of the natural system, along with human ill well-being together, we are again off from that safe and just boundary for both functional integrity and natural ecosystem areas. So all of this points to the fact that things are not going well. We have been impacting nature. Nature is not able to provide the services that we need to the level that we demand, so there is a risk. The risk is well documented, even though it is interesting to note that this is a 2023 World Bank, uh, sorry, World Economic Forums report that highlights that in the next 10 years, by 2033, biodiversity becomes the biodiversity and ecosystem collapse becomes the third top most risk globally for economic system. 
even though that doesn't appear as such within the short term horizon, but it is looming. It's a looming threat to the uh, to our system. It's a major risk in within a decade or so. All of these green green level risks are environment related risks, whether it is the extreme weather event or uh, critical change to Earth system, as I alluded briefly about the safe planetary boundaries or natural resource shortages. So we are facing environmental risk immensely within, within the next decades and biodiversity becomes one of the topmost risk. So knowing this and understanding our dependency and the impact on nature, how do we go about it? What is happening in order to address this? So now I'll, I'll move on to some of the things where this particular program area is focusing on, trying to understand the knowledge gap in biodiversity economics and finance, given the background that we just looked at. Biodiversity economics focuses on the study of human behavior in the use and management of biodiversity or nature. It involves understanding, measuring, valuing biodiversity for better policy and practice. Finance, however, refers to the practice of raising and managing capital and using financial and economic incentive to support sustainable biodiversity management. As I alluded, initially we took a stepwise approach to look at these issues. First, I did a literature review, both peer-reviewed and gray literature, to identify what are the knowledge gaps specific to biodiversity economics and finance, both in peer-reviewed and gray literature. And then also uh, did stakeholder consultation to understand what do they see and what do they observe in both practice and their research. The second part, the stakeholder consultation, is a bit of an ongoing process following the WAPC model. We are in the middle of that um, WAPC work program development pathway. But here I'm going to share with you the observations we got from the literature, both peer reviewed and gray, and what we learned from stakeholder consultation up to this point. So this is the approach that we have taken. Perhaps this is um, not so important, but oh, Overall, we use a systematic approach to look at the title of the publications, peer-reviewed publication in which these keywords are reflected, valuation of biodiversity, biodiversity value, biodiversity economics, economics of biodiversity, biodiversity finance, nature finance, conservation finance, and so forth. So that gives us a certain number of articles that are candidate articles to look at much more deeply, uh, which ended up with articles highlighting one or more knowledge gaps in biodiversity economics. There were 37 of them. Articles highlighting one or more knowledge gaps in biodiversity finance, there are 14 of them. And some articles highlight both types of knowledge gaps. And those common, the article highlighting common knowledge gaps were about three. So then we scan through those peer-reviewed as well as the gray literature is not part of those numbers. It's a, it's a snowballing approach we adopted looking at some pertinent gray literature and working through them to find out uh, what is out there, particularly looking at the publications of World Economic Forum, IPPS, UNEP, uh, and those achieve um, like organizations who are heavily involved in both biodiversity economics and finance. But I must admit that this space is so rapidly evolving that there are so much great literature emerging overnight and it's very difficult to track all of them properly. So uh, that caveat is always there when I say what we have here. This is a bit of a messy diagram, but I'll focus on only five different um, points on this slide. One is starting from 1992 when we had uh, we, CVD was established and the work program were initiated, the critical milestone from economics and finance perspective to look at econo ecosystem service and biodiversity is the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment of 2005, followed by the, the the TIB, the Economics of Ecosystem Services and Biodiversity. Uh, which published a report in 2010 highlighting the fact that 
as an example, investing in nature, investing in particular area uh, management in the US, the 45 million investment would generate 5 billion worth of the ecosystem service value on an annual basis. So it highlights the value of our investment on nature and the return from that. Um, immediately after 2010, in 2012, IP base was established to look at biodiversity and ecosystem service globally on a regional basis and so forth. Since then, it has been working quite actively assessing the assessing the state of biodiversity and ecosystem in different parts of the world with a thematic assessment like biodiversity and business, which is currently happening, or a global uh, assessment like biodiversity and ecosystem service assessment, uh, which published a report in 2019. Um, in parallel to the IPBS work and others, um, the UK Treasury uh, initiated initiated uh, work um, to document the economics of biodiversity, which is also called the Das Gupta Review. Uh, its final report was released in 2021, highlighting the role of biodiversity um, to in our nature, to economy and society. It's quite an extensive report documenting the history and what are the different components that needs to be looked at in order to build what is called inclusive wealth not only just the economic wealth, but the wealth that captures nature, that captures human capital, that captures the economic activity, inclusive wealth. Uh, in 2021, um, again, the United Nations uh, system of environmental economic accounting, ecosystem accounting was really endorsed by the UN. So even though the SIA, the system of environmental economic accounting was in operation, um, which was endorsed by the UN in 2012, but it was in practice immediately after 1993 by different countries in different shape or form. Then the ecosystem accounting came into picture uh, since, uh, since 2021 as a UN endorsed uh, approach to document ecosystem and its services and values. Uh, in 2022, we had what we call Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, which is a framework looking at the 2050 vision, living in harmony uh, with nature, with a four specific goals for 2050 and 23 specific targets for 2030 including 30 by 30 that we talk about um, uh, halting uh, or reversing uh, nature loss and so forth. So there are 23 different targets that to be met by 2030. After the release of Kunming Montreal Biodiversity uh, Protocol, sorry, framework, a lot of things are happening in parallel. If in this slide, there are very active space in 2023, 22, and 24. 24 is particularly quite active. I'm not, I'll touch on some of these, which are reporting frameworks, the voluntary or the regulatory frameworks here, later in one of the slides. But the important thing to note is both the private and public sector is quite actively engaged in it. For example, TNFT came along and developed uh, the guidance document and the disclosure recommendation, which was also released in 2023. It started in 2020-21 and got to that point by 2023. There are very many pilot projects are underway at the moment and some, are, some have completed their first, uh, first level of reporting following TNFT recommendation and so forth. So it's a very actively evolving space in terms of how we account for nature, how we measure nature, how we value nature, how we report our dependency and impact on nature. Um, so moving on to the measurement, um, the different, um, how we measure biodiversity. This is an example slide to indicate the, the logic here. Uh, biodiversity by definition, has different components, like are we talking about genetic diversity or species diversity or ecosystem diversity? Um, those specific components are 
can be looked at somewhat differently. Uh, for example, species can be looked at based on the population size or based on global extinction risk. And there are respective indicators in order to measure the specific component of biodiversity. So the state of biodiversity we currently observe is impacted by those impact drivers or pressures and how we depend or how we link to the biodiversity that the impact and the dependency link is there to define the state of biodiversity. We can measure biodiversity in one or the other form using one or the other indicators which needs to be fit for purpose for our own operation. So we find this um, indicators to measure different component of biodiversity a uh, bit of a evolving space. Uh, there are arguments or uh, there are different opinions about whether we can have a uniform measure which seems to be highly unlikely given biodiversity is a very context specific thing. So how do we how do we in some way integrate different measures of different biodiversity that we are talking when we talk about the biodiversity market into some sort of exchange rate. That's an evolving question. I don't know the answer, but that might be something that is evolving. How do we think about that? That sort of thinking is being developed. But um, thinking about the indicator, then we develop metrics which might help to build a somewhat common metric to uh, compare biodiversity in different uh, setting and context, but they are also not perfect. Uh, I would put that caveat up front. This is a, again, very busy slide. Uh, I will only highlight two points on this one. One is there are very many different type of metrics being adapted or developed, which are based on either a species or extent or condition, extent condition and its significance or some sort of thematic metric and so forth. And different organizations, different agencies, different uh, groups are involved in developing these measurement approaches or the methodology. So the second, the second and third column here are lists some of these examples. It's Perhaps it's not quite exhaustive, but it is a good list that we are able to compile, which helps companies or agencies to, to measure their impact, dependencies, risk, and opportunities in relation to nature. Then there are, along with this measurement, there are frameworks that are out there to, uh, to assess nature as well as to set the target. Uh, so target setting frameworks and assessment frameworks. I alluded a little bit about the SIA, the UN system of environmental economic accounting earlier, which is a helpful uh, framework that allows to assess uh, nature ecosystems uh, of course, uh, ecosystem and economy interacts. All the interaction between between economy and, and, and ecosystem is being captured within that system. Um, but being ecosystem as a specific component of nature, the CIEA allows how do we view ecosystem in terms of both stock and flows, and it has different type of accounts, uh, what is called physical accounts or monetary accounts. And in some case, we talk about stock accounts and flow accounts. So these are the light blue are the physical accounts, the extent account, the condition accounts, and the ecosystem service flow account quantity. The yellow ones are the uh, monetary um, accounts, which are in terms of the value. So ecosystem accounting allows us to look at ecosystem services um, in both physical terms as well as in monetary terms and how that affects the change in the stock or the principal ecosystem and so forth. So that is in practice. Similarly, the another framework for assessment is the T, uh, TNFD leap approach, uh, locate uh, evaluate, assess, and prepare 
and it's it has a very detailed uh, methodology and guidance about it, and I'm not going to elaborate that. Similarly, in terms of the target setting uh, frameworks, the science-based target for nature is one of them, and there are several of the others. So these frameworks are also evolving in order to, oops, in order to integrate or bring nature or biodiversity into our economic or financial decisions. Um, in terms of the valuation, I alluded briefly earlier that I will be very brief on this because uh, this is a very important topic, but there are many different ways. How do we look at, how do we value biodiversity or nature? We can think only from economic dominant approach of valuation, or we can think of more from socially dominated uh, approach of valuing nature, or we can think of from indigenous and local knowledge-based uh, approach to value nature. So in a sense, nature, we put value on nature somewhat differently depending on the context. So we need multiple ways to look at the nature, which is tricky in the sense that it needs resources, it's extensive, it's costly, but we need to incorporate the, these different types of values when we uh, measure, when we develop plan or programs in order to, to economic activities or otherwise that relies on nature. So there is a notion of pluralistic valuation, which combines these different types of uh, things that we consider together and a diverse valuation perspective it takes in order to combine these different perspectives. But uh, the fact of the matter is this approach in practice is, is not that very common. It's, it's still uh, lagging behind in terms of the practice. So why we need to value nature? Just to illustrate the point here, if we keep continuing uh, focusing on instrumental value of nature and keep going with the business as usual, usual scenario, we'll end up somewhere else rather than where we want to end up, which is uh, just and sustainable society in the long term, fulfilling some of these goals, the SDG goals uh, or the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework specific goals in the long term. We want to move there. So we need to move towards what is called green economy pathway or somewhat different pathway than the business as usual. And all of these depends on our value system, how we value nature, how we measure, how we document them, in our plan policies, how we implement them and so forth. So for a brighter future, we need to integrate this holistic value that we have on nature into our plan policies and program going forward. So that's what we learned uh, from the literature when we were reviewing it. One thing that is in practice is the SIA, ecosystem accounting. This map is also busy, but what I would like to indicate here is these different colors suggest that the number of percentage of countries with biodiversity as a policy priority in relation to system of environmental economic accounting. So if we look at, let's say Oceania, there are six countries with biodiversity as a policy priority in line of implementing the SIA system. Uh, if we think of how many countries have account, developed these uh, ecosystem accounts in 2023, only about 35 countries have developed it, and Australia is one of them. If we think about the number of countries compiling different type of CI account, as I mentioned earlier, ecosystem extent account, the condition account, ecosystem service flow account, ecosystem service flow account in monetary term, physical term, ecosystem asset account in monetary term, and by species account. None of the countries have um, developed this species account in, at a national level, but a fewer countries have developed these ecosystem asset accounts and somewhat, somewhat um, more than just over 10 countries or 14 countries have developed the monetary ecosystem service flow account. So this is progressing. This is just the beginning after the uh, implementation of CIEA in 2021. This is a 20, 2023 um, state. So it is evolving. But one of the things about the CIA and then from, for those who, um, for those of us who are looking at it from economic values perspective, the CIA depends on exchange value notion rather than the welfare value notion. So the CIA, whatever, uh, how we account the value of ecosystem or the nature 
in CS system is primarily guided by the exchange value notion. And how do we create the exchange value? How do we measure those things? It depends on a particular nested approach that the CI document suggests. We need to use the methods uh, where the price for the ecosystem service is directly observable. That's the best one, all the way to the methods where the price for the ecosystem service is based on expected expenditure or markets. So it's more inclined to those avoided cost replacement, cost direct price, and so those type of approaches. In terms of financing, that's the valuation, that's the practice in some ways across the countries. In terms of the biodiversity financing, there is a huge gap, over 700 million biodiversity finance gap annually, uh, based on 2019 estimate, in order to fulfill the demand. So this graph here shows the gap that we need to fulfill. Um, if we want to achieve those Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework targets and the goals. Uh, these are the ways by which we can fill those gaps. The green boxes indicates different ways we can fill those gaps. The green financial product, uh, natural infrastructure, biodiversity offset, domestic budgets and tax policy and of, of course avoiding some environmentally harmful subsidies in agriculture, forestry and so forth. So here is a, a diagram that shows who are the actors in financing space, philanthropy, public agency, private agency and the blended finance between public uh, private partnership uh, within those specific financing actor how they can finance it or who are the specific actors within them, foundation and NGO or company CSR, corporate social responsibility within the philanthropic approach. And similarly, there are national and regional governments, intergovernmental organizations, multilateral development banks and so forth as a public entity and public private blended of the partnership. Um, can also finance biodiversity in terms of nature infrastructure, debt for nature swap and conservation bond. Um, private agencies, financial institutions, banks, insurers and investors and the real economy corporations, they can finance biodiversity in a number of ways, sustainability linked bank or loans, nature focused use of proceeds, uh, insurance products, nature impact funds, and alike, including biodiversity certificate credits or carbon credits and so forth. So in my original diagram, these are the financing mechanism by which we can inject resources to conserve biodiversity, manage it in order to generate ecosystem services uh, in which we all rely on directly, indirectly. Along with this financing uh, situation, there are also evolving reporting disclosure frameworks uh, if we think about the regulatory framework for disclosure, EU is quite in advance. For example, European Sustainability Reporting Standard on Biodiversity and Ecosystem, uh, which is part of the US, EU's Corporate uh, Sustainability Reporting Directive. Similarly, other initiatives, uh, regulatory initiatives are already there. EU Deforestation Regulation, EU Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, uh, use sustainable finance disclosure regulation and so forth. And there are some voluntary initiatives like the TNFD disclosure uh, recommendation and additional guidance of the TNFD, which is voluntary at the moment, biodiversity standards of the global reporting uh, initiative, GRI, which uh, TNFD and GRI are working together to align their reporting structures. So, uh, hope so that there won't be sort of different ways one needs to do things depending on which framework they adopt to report. Um, biodiversity disclosure requirement of the CDP, general requirement for disclosure of sustainability related financial information, the uh, International Financial Regulating Standards S1, uh, which is the product of the International Sustainability Standard Board. So these are voluntary standards. And the regulatory space is quite fast, quite um, quite fluid and moving. Uh, in the EU, EU passed a new, what we call nature restoration law last June, requiring 20% of nature to be restored by 2030. 
UK has 10% net biodiversity gain policy, effective policy, and Australia has also developed what we call nature repair market, moving into that direction to provide a space uh, to invest in biodiversity conservation. Corporate environment is also rapidly changing, following from this uh, the climate task force on climate related financial disclosure. Now the climate related disclosure for a certain type of businesses is mandatory going forward. And they are also preparing towards the nature related financial disclosure. They are doing their in-house work uh, in many contexts, how, how they will look at their impact dependencies, risk and opportunities and so forth. So that is also quite active and in a very fast pace. Uh, uh, given what we learned from gray literature. Sustainability disclosure standards are becoming common. Um, in 2023, uh, sustainability related financial disclosure came into force. The IF, uh, IFRS, International Financial Regulating Standards. Yes, one is for sustainability related financial disclosures and yes, two is primarily for climate related financial disclosure. Australia just passed the Australian Accounting Standard Board just endorsed these standards last week on 20th of September. The SRS-1, which is about Australian standard, Australian Sustainability Reporting Standard S1, which is for uh, sustainability, which is voluntary uh, as of now, and Australian standards for reporting, uh, Australian Sustainability Reporting Standard S2, which is mandatory, and it is for climate-related uh, uh, sustainability reporting. Um, so that's the space in which we are in, in terms of measuring, valuing, reporting, and different frameworks. Now, I would like to highlight some of the knowledge gaps that uh, we observed uh, during this exploration. Those are some of the facts that we observed. Knowledge gaps in, in biodiversity economics and finance, we have put it to, into two forms, but one can look at it collectively. The blue are more towards the economics and the red are more about the finance. The conceptualization, our understanding is still a challenge and there are things need to be done through research in order to improve that. Uh, the another theme evolved was the biodiversity data, valuation tools and methods, fit for purpose type of methods and the data are still uh, in uh, short supply. And we need to find effective ways and cost-effective uh, mechanism to obtain data uh, to fit with uh, the required purpose of the agency or organizations. Biodiversity market, both the demand and supply side factors, even though it seems like there is a lot of push from supply side in the biodiversity market at the moment, but we do not know fully the demand side of it. And what are the type of biodiversity credits, the volume, the price, and the quality they are asking for, we do not have enough information on that. Similarly, the policy uptake of these uh, biodiversity or nature-related valuation results and leveraging transformation, the policy space is also not um, moving to the level that is required. There is a lot of things that needs to be done in terms of research and providing input to uh, increase the policy uptake. On the finance side as well, uh, the impact of the policy, regulation, institution, um, the financial uh, policy, regulation or institutions and impact on nature. There is a lack of knowledge on that space. Financial risk and cost, better handling or better understanding of this is still not adequate enough. Biodiversity metrics and measurement techniques, as I alluded earlier, I showed a full page long different methodology. Sometimes it's super confusing. Uh, fit for purpose type of biodiversity metrics and measurement techniques are still in short supply. Financing options, mechanism, finance flows, and their impacts and scaling pathways. We started to see some of those things, but there is a uh, quite a great deal of information or uh, the research input needed to know the effective uh, scaling, uh, effective pathways to scale up uh, uh, biodiversity finance to generate greater impact. 
and also there there is a great deal of work which uh, is happening at the moment but is still reporting nature related impact dependencies and risk is, is knowledge on that aspect is, is still in search supply so this is just an example I'll illustrate, uh, given the time, uh, about the conceptualization of biodiversity values and data. It's a complex relationship when you talk about biodiversity and ecosystem services. That complex relationship, site-based, place-based, landscape-based relationship, our understanding is still not enough. The culture and nature, we touched earlier on how different cultures are linked with nature, how these cultural values, cultural practices are impacting nature in a positive way or in a negative way. What are those cultural traditions that are beneficial to nature? Uh, we, we, we still need to identify those effective cultural approaches to uh, preserve nature or improve nature. Uh, in that line, the IPLC, the indigenous people and local communities knowledge and values, embedding them into, many, into decisions are still lagging behind. Uh, more importantly, the change in biodiversity and its impact on human well-being, the change, we are still talking about the level, but we are not talking about the change, how those changes affect Changes in biodiversity state affect the human well-being. Research in that space is uh, still in early stage. Valuation, I mentioned earlier, plural valuation, which in theory is uh, very appealing, but in practice, it is lagging behind. And lack of primary data across regions, time, and the required scale is something that, uh, that I, I mentioned. And in many of the uh, documentation and the conversation we have had, uh, this has been pointed out as one of the one of the challenges. Similarly, there are challenges in metrics and measurement approaches. There are challenges uh, related to the finance. So let me highlight a few of those finance-related challenges: investment decision and exposure, exposure to adverse environmental impacts. We don't know those things fully, and um, even the acronyms that we see in, in this space like ESG, SRI, CSR, these are sometimes confusing. That's what um, we observe. The consensus and clarity on the meanings of um, ESG, uh, SRI or corporate social responsibility or su sustainable, uh, sustainably responsible investing or environmental social governance, these things need to be clearer uh, in order to bring those into practice. Data on biodiversity related financial flows or expenditure from private, civil society and finance sector are lacking. Even we have incomplete information from government sector, but from this sector, that space is quite open. Performance and impact of biodiversity finance. We do finance it, but how well it worked or not in order to achieve the intended outcome so and so forth and finally the de-risking studies and pilot projects for blended finance type of things um, those are still in short supply if i focus now for the next uh, few minutes about australia and western australia um, we know australia is a great country mega one of the mega diverse countries in the world housing 600 to 700 species um, if you look at this stat, it tells us that uh, around 106 of the ecological communities in Australia are threatened and just over 2,100 species of flora and fauna collectively are also threatened. Australia is a unique place. We have a lot of endemic species. They are not available anywhere in the world. If we think about frog, 94% of the frogs in Australia are endemic. But what we observe over time is um, this graph here uh, in the bottom left corner shows that the number of threatened species um, in, in our system uh, nationwide, uh, how many animals, how many plants, and how many ecological communities are listed as threatened. Uh, recently, we have some addition in that list um, as threatened species or ecological communities. Despite that, we have policies and plan, for example, threatened species action plan, um, zero extinction policy, the strategies to manage threatened species and so forth. But because of the in 
the environment in which different type of species uh, we have, the climate we have, all these different impact forces are creating our effort is perhaps not adequate to slow down this extension or the species, species being threatened. Uh, there is a lot of room to improve on this space. Uh, if we look at Western Australia, which is one of the, which hosts uh, eight of the 15 Australian biodiversity host spots, including Southwest of Australia as one of the global hot spot out of 36 that we have, 65 ecological communities, about 250 fauna and over 240 flora species are listed as threatened in WA itself. Uh, both at the Commonwealth and the state level um, government, uh, the policies, if we look at policy space, mainstreaming nature or climate into policy is a very active policy space at the moment. On the left side, that slide, that part shows what is happening at the federal level since 2021. On the right side, it shows what is happening at the state level to mainstream uh, nature and to some degree climate also uh, within WA. If we if we look at these movements or different activities, what is happening, they are trying to bring policy to facilitate how we can mainstream biodiversity, both in private and public decision makings. It's a really active space, not only from policy, um, uh, traditional conservation-oriented uh, institutions, but also from financial institutions, also from private sector initiatives and so forth. It's a really uh, active policy space that we observe these days, both at the state level as well as at the Commonwealth level. And uh, I'm sure we all are familiar with this, so I wouldn't elaborate that. If we, if we look at the practice, that's the policy space in practice, uh, natural capital accounting is a common approach that is being agreed between Commonwealth and state governments to mainstream uh, ecosystems into uh, our economic decisions. So using natural capital accounting or the CIEA, I'm using it synonymously. Um, the federal government has initiated some regional ecosystem account through DQ projects, thematic accounts and so forth, including the Western Australian wheat belt. Uh, the report of this regional ecosystem account was released uh, somewhat earlier this year. CSIRO is actively working in developing guidance methodology and developing uh, different metrics to measure biodiversity and alike. Uh, in this space, uh, farming for the future initiatives, accounting for nature, different corporate agencies are also doing corporate natural capital accounting. Um, and the companies like Forico, they are all engaged in developing uh, natural capital accounting and for their uh, businesses or the operations and alike. So it's a very active space um, in terms of the practice as well through natural capital accounting approach. Uh, just to add uh, this, uh, this last, possibly the third last slide here, uh, I mentioned earlier that the Australian um, Accounting Standard Board endorsed the uh, uh, sustainability reporting standards uh, on 20th of September, uh, which is the ESG um, sustainability, including ESG side of things. They will come into force uh, from 1 January 2025. As I mentioned earlier, the sustainability related reporting is voluntary at this stage, but the climate related reporting is mandatory. So if a company or organization uh, falls either Two of the three criteria here, the financial year consolidated revenue in the financial year consolidated gross asset in the financial year full-time equivalent employees. If two of these criteria meets, then you are, you are within that bracket and you need to report it. Um, and or these are the other criteria based on which you will be reporting. Uh, it will start from 1 January uh, 2025 for group one, um, and then by 2027, 1 July for Group 3. And there will be a reference reporting or review of those reported um, sustainability reports, a review and those sort of things. That will, I think that will happen by 2030 July. That's the, that's the plan. So the key point is sustainability reporting 
in terms of the climate is becoming mandatory for those organizations who fall within this um, criteria. It includes um, asset owners like um, re uh, registrable superannuation entities, registered schemes and rentals, national greenhouse and energy reporting uh, reporters, and those who fall within this revenue bracket that I mentioned earlier. So it's, it's a very fastly moving space uh, in terms of sustainability reporting. So the challenges, if we think about Australia and Western Australia, they are generally speaking much more in common with what type of challenges we found from um, broader literature. Um, stakeholder consultation have highlighted knowledge gaps in some of these key aspects. Um, they relate to understanding, meaning and valuing. They are common. The data model and disclosure frameworks, fit for purpose type of data model and the framework for businesses um, and other agencies are needed. Uh, I, I understand that it is an active space among the corporations as well. The, um, they are also working towards this, but this is something still uh, research has greater depth to contribute to. Biodiversity market, both the demand and supply side of things through the nature repair market, this is becoming a bit uh, more active in Australian discussion. But as I mentioned earlier, supply side of things, we see eagerness to supply, but in terms of the demand, there is expectation, but is that real? and what type of biodiversity certificate, at what volume, at what price. All these things about market is yet to be um, matured. Uh, we are in a very early stage of in that direction. Finance um, biodiversity as a investable good at a scale. Um, it, is, it is now the Australian government's approach is the climate first approach. But given what is happening at the uh, federal level, the treasuries, uh, some initiatives, the financial um, roadmap that uh, I wanted to touch based on that. Uh, sorry about that. The, the, the Australian Sustainable Finance Taxonomy, Treasury Laws Amendments, and those sort of things are, and the Sustainable Finance Roadmap, which was uh, endorsed in 2023. These are, in a way, forcing financial institutions and different entities to look at it much more closely, but climate is at the moment uh, the focus, but biodiversity is the next door in my view. So uh, this, this is a very actively moving space locally as well as nationally and internationally. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to almost um, conclude uh, what I'm about to say, which is why we are doing this now because there is an increased interest in the Nature Positive Journey. Uh, Global Nature Positive Summit uh, is just next week. Uh, mechanisms needed to fulfill national and international commitment. National commitment, for example, that include NBSAP, the SDG target 2030, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework targets 2030, 30 by 30 and alike. Financing all these national and international commitments are there and that are also forcing us to move into that direction. Enabling efficient, cost-effective, and socially inclusive decisions on nature and biodiversity. That is the sense of the time. We need that sort of things. And ensuring a nature positive future for all of us, uh, species of all types. So because of all of this, we think that this is the right time to address this type of knowledge gaps to help uh, local economy, local uh, organizations, all of us who are engaged in dealing with nature directly or indirectly to fulfill some of these knowledge gaps and to move into uh, the next phase where we can improve the outcome. So in this journey, we are in the middle at this stage. We have finished the initial individual engagement and we scoped the challenges and had a first round of consultation with the experts. And we are going to implement the second phase in which it's a reiterative process. Uh, we are going to organize a few workshops in November to go through uh, the end users knowledge needs locally for WA purposes and then reiterate with those uh, resource uh, the 
research institutions or those who can provide that knowledge and to develop this program going forward for WAPSI and its uh, stakeholders. Um, the report, the, this is a preliminary report, as we alluded earlier, is due uh, this Friday. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ram. That was a fantastic uh, presentation and uh, a really wide-ranging journey through um, the drivers globally uh, and locally, um, the, the metrics, the measures, the, the challenges in valuation. Uh, and great to see that the report will be out at the end of the week, which will allow people to take that deeper dive and um, have a bit of time to digest the, the, the body of work that has been done. Um, there's a few questions have come through uh, in the in the chat while you've been talking, and I'll try and pull some of those together. I think one of them you've already answered. So someone asked about uh, who was the lead agency in in WA for the the SIA national accounts. Uh, I believe you said that uh, DQ are developing those accounts, but uh, ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, will actually release them as as they do for uh, the the other uh, national accounts. Um, so. They that that one was covered off if i'm correct on that uh, i think it's the the australian bureau of statistics in conjunction with the dq they are developing yeah. it and releasing it if it is for the local wa uh, i think uh, we have i believe it's the dior is the mm. uh, the contact point for that uh, but we can confirm that but that's my perception locally yeah i think the uh, the question was was on the commonwealth level so it's yes. abs and, uh, and dq Yep. One, uh, of the other, to, one of the other, go ahead. Just to add on that, the Commonwealth is planning to release the national ecosystem accounts covering all states uh, and territory early next year. Uh, so uh, this is a very active space to watch. They, are, they already released the information paper and they're going to release those accounts next year. So, thank you. Um, one question that come through and I'll combine it with with another one as well is around the urgency of action uh, and sort of uh, whether we can act based on simplified measures and another uh, question that came through was around, around you talked around valuing uh, valuing to capture the importance of biodiversity but do we need to agree on that value uh, have an exchange rate before we act so can we act uh, in partial knowledge well um, I think if we wait for the perfect answer, it would be too late in my mind. So we need to act in the interim. The exchange rate notion, I was giving a sort of example that would be ideal. But I think finding that ideal answer is not very likely. As I, as I sort of alluded earlier that biodiversity is a highly context dependent um, entity. And then that context, when we create it using some sort of metric, down the track, we might be able to have that sort of exchange rate between different types of metrics, uh, different types of habitat, different types of biodiversity. But I think we need to act now based on the knowledge we have. My discussion with the biologist and the scientist uh, with, at CSIRO, in fact, indicates that measurement is not a problem. We do have the uh, right way to measure um, biodiversity, for, but we still need to look for fit for purpose type of approach. Uh, I think we are we are there. We don't need to wait too long for that. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that, that has come through um, and um, uh, is around whether you in doing this review so far have, have seen any emerging areas of best practice for uh, Australia in terms of um, biodiversity accounting or finance? Um, oh, I think uh, in terms of the best practice, uh, for example, uh, we have seen some of those things evolving in Australia. For example, I briefly highlighted there uh, one of the the, um, the work done by uh, the Farming for the Future, the work done by um, Accounting for Nature, and there are some initiatives. Um, but 
I'm not arguing one is better than the other or something like that, but there are some good examples. And another is the mining sector has taken a bit of a lead, even globally, uh, in terms of how they have embedded natural capital accounting in their operations, which is a great example. And I uh, I think these are some of the good examples, but the CSIRO's work on this space is commendable. They are working really hard uh, trying to develop this sort of metrics in a complex situation through um, um, GQ and ESP or other collaborations, I believe. Uh, there are good practices. One of the things I would say is perhaps the, uh, the cost of as a practitioner, we might need to think about the cost-effective approach. Which one is going to give me the best outcome given the lowest, co lower, lowest cost? If we think from that lens, we are not at there in my view. We are still in practicing stage. And um, as you demand more detailed in those uh, natural capital accounting process, the cost is going to go up. So uh, we are I don't think we are uh, there to suggest that, and we did not see, okay, this this is enough. So um, there is still a room, uh, great great deal of things to be done. Uh, but there are good examples, I said, in the farming context, as well as in the mining sector, and some other, even in the marine space, there are some accounts developed. So good examples are out there already. I think that, that point that, that you raise around um, the, the measures that give us enough information to make decisions uh, without all the detail, because we can we can drill down and down and down in more and more detail. Um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and it's OK if you're working in a very data rich environment, um, uh, but that then uh, penalizes environments where perhaps that data is not readily available or um, or uh, the the financial um, uh, capacity of the organizations involved doesn't allow for the spend to do that detailed work. So it's getting that balance right of yes, in enough, yes. enough to be confident uh, and get on with making some decisions. Um, uh, early in your presentation, you touched on the the finance gap um, and the the uh, uh, the value of some of those global ecosystem uh, services, and and sometimes those numbers can be really vast. Yeah, so yeah, the finance yeah. gap is vast, the, the services are vast, uh, and, and in some ways they become sort of almost crippling or, or meaningless in terms of, of making uh, decisions or uh, action on the ground. Is there yeah. benefit in those huge global numbers? Uh, is it possible to maybe think uh, more regionally? Uh, and how might that be applied in, in a West Australian context? Um, a very good point. I think the good question. Oh, I think the that's what I at one point I mentioned that those numbers could be lower or upper, and we we do not need to perhaps uh, rely heavily on that number, whatever we pick at a global level, because there are a lot of uncertainties involved in estimating those numbers. But the fact of the matter is, the issue is of great importance. So that's the point. I was trying to make that number is secondary, but the extent of the issue that we are dealing with is huge enough for us to move or react in that direction. That's the first um, um, response. So the secondly, it would be really great to look at localized case, localized example at a regional scale, or even at a, perhaps the regional scale would be sufficient enough for, for us to make a site level decisions. Uh, and for that purpose, like the regional um, accounts that the DQ and ABS they have developed are quite helpful uh, to look at what's happening in the region in terms of that. And they also, this is my view that these accounts, they, they are coming in the first lot are perhaps not perfect. They, there is room to improve, but that's the very good starting point. And having a regional uh, sort of uh, statistics would definitely helpful for Western Australia because it's unique in both biodiversity term and our dependency on the nature is different than many other jurisdictions or internationally. So we need a localized context to see what's, what's the value that 
we are talking in a local context. But perhaps there is a room to generate that and it is evolving. Um, I, I might not be aware of that. Uh, I take that responsibility, but uh, having that is a great way to think, given how our economy is shaped is somewhat different than the other places. Having that sort of number locally um, adjustable would be great asset. Excellent. Thank you, Ram. Um, just as we uh, move towards uh, the concluding moments of our webinar, I'll remind everybody again uh, that the uh, report um, will be out at the end of this week, uh, Friday the 4th of October, uh, releasing that report, and that will be available on the Wobsey uh, website, uh, wobsey.org.au. Uh, the link is there on the screen. Um, and um, just I'll give you a moment's uh, pre-warning ram of, of my final question to you, which is sure. uh, going into the, the Nature Positive Summit next week. Uh, measuring and valuing uh, nature gives us this baseline and helps us on that journey towards Nature Positive. If you had one question that you would be able to ask uh, at the Nature Positive Summit, uh, what would that be? And I'll let you think on that for a moment while I ask people um, to okay. um, take Take a moment to um, scan this QR code. Uh, uh, that will link you to a survey, which will give you uh, the opportunity to give us some feedback on uh, both this webinar and the webinar series as a whole. Uh, if you can't get your QR code to, to work, there's the um, uh, link there, and that link will also be uh, in um, the correspondence that we send out with the recording of the session. Um, um, so Ram, with that well, mere 30 yeah, seconds that's to a, think that's of an a, answer. That's a great question, and I think uh, if I can answer that question correctly, it's a million dollar prize I would be out there perhaps because it's a, such an important topic. I would view, uh, if I get an opportunity to ask a question, this is, the, this is how or this is the way I would frame it. We don't need to go anywhere else to, to see the devastation of nature and its impact upon us. We can see it all around us momentarily. If we just think uh, deeply, what's happening with the extreme weather event around us? Just look at the season, look at what is happening around us. We get the sense that the balance between nature and our interaction with nature for whatever the purpose we use nature is is tilting. It is not stable. It's not only about nature. Nature, um, th that balance will be further jeopardized because of the climate change and the the extent of effect that we will experience in Australia or in Western Australia or in generally everywhere, but in Australia is perhaps a bit more than um, other places because of where we are in our drier uh, uh, continent. So in that sense, how do we develop synergies working with these environmental problems. So nature is one, biodiversity is one, climate is another one, pollution is the another one. There are so many others, but we need a framework to think through addressing environmental problem holistically, putting climate as a one, biodiversity as a second, or uh, pollution as a third, whatever that might be. So how to develop synergies in addressing nature loss while also addressing other environmental issues, which are of priority. What's the, what's the approach that the governments would like to take going forward? And I would like to ask that question. Thank you, Ram. I think that would be a, an excellent question, and I hope you do get the opportunity to raise that, <laughs> that topic next week uh, in, in Sydney. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your participation in today's uh, webinar. Uh, as as mentioned, uh, please take the opportunity to give us some feedback through uh, the, the online survey on the screen. It's also uh, the link in the chat function. Um, and um, we look forward to welcoming you to another uh, Big Issues in Biodiversity Science uh, webinar uh, at a future date. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Juan. Thank you for your time.